All right, folks, we're going to reconvene. It is 542. The next bill that the committee will hear is uh, Bill LO21-0013, investigative hearing on the mismanagement of Baltimore Police Overtime for the purpose of requesting members of the Baltimore City Police Department and the Office of the Inspector General come before the Public Safety and Government Operations Committee to discuss the findings of case 21-0021-I, investigation alleging mismanagement of overtime resources by Baltimore City Police. Uh, this bill was introduced on July 19th, 2021, and it was sponsored by myself, Councilmember Conway. Um, and um, as I open up, I think we wanna look at this. Unlike the, the police budget approved as part of the city's annual budget, overtime is um, often, uh, approved later on. And so um, after years when overtime and spending in some areas has been excessive, it's incumbent that the real controls be instituted and that the department be responsible about the money that they're charging to the police, uh, to the uh, Baltimore taxpayer. Um, the task force recently announced by the commissioner to respond to the audit findings is a step in the right direction. Um, but we of course know that a task force is not the end, it is a means to an end. And I wanna, make sure we have an opportunity to hear more about the protocols and benchmarks that uh, BPD will be using to address this issue and others. Um, you know, I, our police department has um, has done a phenomenal job, I want to say, in the in the past years addressing overtime, and I want to make sure that credit is given and, and due. Um, but this is, a, I think, a glaring opportunity to further dig into our overtime issues and address some of the problems that are brought forward. So I want to thank um, the IG for um, bringing this forward, and I want to thank the police department for being transparent with us and trying to figure out what opportunities we have in front of us to better understand this, this problem and then fix this problem going forward. Um, so with that, I want to open the floor up to um, the Office of the Inspector General. Um, Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Um, good afternoon, Chairman Conway and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Isabel Mercedes Cumming, and I am the Inspector General of Baltimore City. Um, I'd like to sincerely thank you for inviting myself and my Deputy of Investigations, Michelle Phillips, to this hearing. Um, we usually aren't given this opportunity, and we truly do appreciate it. Um, as everybody knows, um, the Office of the Inspector General receives most of its complaints from tips from the public. In this case was no exception. Um, as always, we're in debt to the citizens for the information. The issues that the OIG examined um, were twofold. Uh, first, that certain sworn officers were paid for overtime that they did not do. Um, this part of the investigation is actually in front of the Professional um, Public Integrity Bureau and it's ongoing. And second, we received an allegation that BPD employees were receiving overtime compensation for coming in on days that they were actually scheduled for personal or vacation leave. So this resulted in them getting about two and a half times their pay for working on those days. And at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to my Deputy of Investigations, Michelle Phillips, um, and she's gonna talk about basically how we did this and what our findings were. Good afternoon, Councilman Conway, Councilman Burnett, and um, the rest of the members of this particular um, committee. When looking at this allegation, we went on ahead and col collected multiple sources of data in order to get a clear understanding of how overtime process is working. So with that being said. Uh, Michelle, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Your, your, your filter, your camera filter, Oh. We can see you at all. We can see a, a background. It might oh. help you take that off. I don't have a camera filter on. Uh, it looks like an office in the background. I didn't put it on there. Oh, interesting. Well, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll talk to I'm you. I'm sorry. All good. Uh, you can continue. Absolutely. Um, I apologize for that. I definitely don't have a filter on at all. I didn't even try to put it on there. But in the interim, we collected a lot of information. We reviewed the FOP MOU and we talked to several individuals, both sworn and civilian from the Baltimore City Police Department. 
Office of the Labor Commissioner and uh, the Department of Finance in order to gather the information. Once we concluded that this practice was a practice that is accepted by um, Baltimore City, we looked into possible um, internal controls that may potentially be lacking in reviewing this process when it came to management approving this practice. So we understand that there are emergency instances where this practice needs to be done. You have to call in individuals um, that are a part of the patrol unit or special operations. But when it came to certain units that are collapsible, such as um, the quartermaster unit or things of that nature, we looked into those issues. And then we found that there may be a lack of management oversight when it came to the distribution of this particular type of overtime usage. And we gave those findings to BPD to see if they could tighten up some internal controls and um, to further review the management portion of overtime for the BPD. And they were able to look at our findings and offer an opinion and a response to our investigation. Thank you. Is, is that all we have? Yes. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to the police department. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, for the record, I'm Michelle Wurzberger. I'm the Director of Government Affairs for the Baltimore Police Department. Um, I am joined today by our Chief of Staff, Eric Melanson, and our Chief Financial Officer, Shala Graham. Um, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Chief Melanson in a second, but I, I, I have to say thank you for pointing out um, the things that we've been doing and, and, and some of the things that we've been doing really, really well. Um, this administration has been working tirelessly to put controls in place um, and, and to be a better BPD, frankly. Um, and so Eric is going to talk a little bit more about that, but I, I didn't want the, the moment to pass without saying that. Eric? Thank you, Michelle. Uh, can everyone hear me? Very good. Uh, so first of all, I, again, I want to thank the OIG for bringing this to our attention. Uh, whenever there are concerns about uh, potential waste, fraud, or abuse, we, we always work in partnership with them to ensure that we're being open, transparent. They have access to all of our resources. They have access to me to be able to answer questions about how policies are put into place. And that represented this, this effort that resulted in the report that, that we're talking about here today. Um, among the issues that were identified one of them was a systems issue, uh, and that's an issue that I wanted to talk a little bit about. Uh, the ADP system that used to be our payroll system of record was one of a lot of challenges when it came to implementing an understanding of schedules, an understanding of uh, the right level of accountability. Workday, which has now become part of how we manage our payroll resources, has been able to really change the paradigm in our ability to hold accountable our supervisors in our units for the actual times worked and the overtimes for which they're authorized. And so for us, it's it's a big change in how they operate. And I think for us, it's a it's an opportunity to ensure that the system works for us and doesn't continue to enshrine past practices that are not good, not good for the department. Uh, I have my dog with me today also presenting, so uh, please forgive me for that. Um, but I do think that for us, it represents that that use of technology to enhance accountability, um, making sure people are where they say they are, when they work, when they say they are working. Uh, and so for us, that was a big finding for us, um, in ensuring that we're getting the place where we need to get to when it comes to these systems of accountability. Give me one moment, please, if you don't mind. I've been there, don't worry. <laughs> My you know, with my... these with these home uh, with these Zoom meetings, if it's not a pet, it's a kid. So, <laughs> and I have a kid in the other room as well. So, um, my apologies for that. So, so that's the first big thing that we found. But the second thing that I wanted to talk about is the systems of control that you referenced, Mr. Chairman, um, in getting our house in order for how overtime is managed in this department. There are a lot of past practices that we have to undo. One of them is the one that. The OIG just described and and their finding of this issue of people being able to work on a vacation day that they've already put in for uh, is one that we're looking at very 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 um, closely because while the MOU might allow for certain provisions 
when it comes to time off be considered being considered hours worked. We want to make sure that the effect of it is not uh, to the detriment of of the taxpayer. Um, you know, if a person's available to work, they should they should work just like anyone normally should work. Um, and so we're looking at again systems uh, in the workday system to be able to change how that how that happens if it happens, uh, and being able to recategorize leave a certain way. Our chief financial officer, Shala Graham, kind of speak to where we are on that. I know, Mr. Chairman, you had questions about what are the overall financial impact of, of this practice. We're, we're looking into that data as well uh, because it's important for us to know and understand that it's not just about, you know, even if it's even if it's just one dollar wasted, it's still a bad dollar wasted. And so for us, the practice is worth looking at. Um, and then finally, our, our instruments, our policies, our, our, our procedures that we're putting into place, we've already seen tremendous success in, in turning around the pattern of overtime spending prior to before Commissioner Harrison was was brought into this uh, into his position, and and we've been able to see year over year reductions of overtime spending without an impact to the crime fight, frankly. Uh, and so for us, that's a that's a big uh, that's a big message we want to send about spending our resources the right way, responsibly, targeted, uh, with an eye towards data driven approaches and and strategies towards uh, you know the responsible use of this in the crime fight. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll turn it over to, to Chief Graham to talk a little bit about some of the controls we're putting into place, both on the payroll side and in the system side. Um, and with that, after that, we can open up for, for questions for you or, or whatever you'd like to address, if, if that's okay. That works. Chief Graham. Chief Graham. Well, good afternoon, Council President. Thank you for having me here tonight, and I'd be happy to discuss the controls we put in place. Um, there is actually a, a policy talking about this, um, and what we have done is we have um, sent out a clarifying email across all BPD about this policy and prohibiting um, people from having essentially um, leave um, and absences and um, not allowing them to use overtime at the same time or the, or the double dipping as it's being referred to. Um, so we sent that out across all BPD. Um, and we've also worked with the city for them to develop us a report um, that shows now if anyone is not complying with that policy so that we can create correct, sorry, take corrective action as needed. Um, and that's one of the great benefits of Workday is we now have this transparency to what's going on um, with our employees and we can get reports that tells us if policies are being complied to and not being complied with. And that is a big change from ADP because we did not have that transparency. So the first thing, we've sent that email out. We've um, developed a report that tells us if it's not being complied with. And the third thing we've been doing, we think this is very important. We have a lot of payroll policies. We've got some payroll policies that are active from many years ago. We've got new payroll policies that we had to put in place because of Workday. Um, and what we want to do is we want to make it easy for our employees to know the rules. It should not be hard for them to know the rules. So we are basically creating a master payroll policy where we consolidate all of these payroll policies in one place where it's easy for the employees to have transparency to what the rules are. The next thing we've done is um, we have um, put in a ticket and we're starting to work with the city to um, talk about the workday configuration and if there is a way within workday to um, prohibit um, an employee taking leave and at the same time um, uh, having voluntary overtime within the same time period that they're taking leave. So these are some of the controls that we put in place. Um, our compliance report um, that the city was able to pull for us has given us some preliminary data on the cost of this um, for four months. And the cost per month it's been costing the city is $25,000 a month. And if you times that by 12, the um, yearly cost is just under 300,000, which is 1% of our overtime budget. But as the chief of staff mentioned, we wanna make sure that we are accountable for every dollar. So even though this is a small cost, we are taking the necessary steps to ensure that we're being accountable and that we're following our policies and we're making it easy for our employees to know the policies, because that's very important too. And that we can also, um, pull reports and pull data to make sure that people are complying with the policies. And with that, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions about these corrective actions. Thank you, sir. 
Thank you, Chief Graham. Um, anything else from BPD before we jump into questions? All right. Oh, um, no, sir. We can we can proceed. Sure. Um, I, I'm I'm curious for um, just to un understand um, generally. Is, is this an issue that we knew about before the IG's report, or did we find out with the IG's report about this problem? So I think a lot of what we're discovering, especially with the with the work that the IG performed, is just the the ability for this to occur. Um, that there was some uh, anecdotal stories about it happening. There was more, you know, overviews done overall about the use of overtime and how pervasive it was. Um, to see a clear example of it brought to our attention, I think we had not yet received that that kind of level of clarity before this report. Again, part of our, our approach on this is you bring us something like this, we're going to fix it. And our goal is to fix it and prevent it from happening again. Um, you know, there is no, I mentioned this before, I think, uh, you know, to some of my colleagues, you know, we're, we're going to create better systems. We're going to create better policies. Um, but the truth is, is that there is no perfect system. And if we find, even in a new iteration a year from now, uh, a, another path for which somebody has, determined a way to to potentially abuse the system, we will enhance our policies again. You know, this is an iterative process. Uh, there is no perfect system that will prevent all of these issues, but our approach is always one of you give us the information, we're going to address it, we're going to prevent that that from happening again and continue to build and improve and evolve uh, those systems in a go forward basis. And so we're again we're thankful for that information so that it can be addressed. Every dollar we waste in the fashion that is not necessary is a dollar we could have used towards enhancing our ability to fight crime and, and protect the citizens. And so that's that's the the overall approach we want to take. Uh, well, well stated. I, I, my my other question, um, and I, I think Chief Shiloh, you 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 talked about all the things that we're doing. Is there any way for this to continue to happen now that we've taken some of these corrective measures? I think obviously now we're enforcing um, the, the compliance to the policy. Um, sometimes it takes a while for that change to, to go through. So um, there might be some small people not complying, but that's just because it's they're getting used to the change. But now that we can remind them of the policy, we have the ability to hold them accountable to the policy. Um, I think in a month from now, you know, this should not be a common practice at all. And now that we've clarified the direction we're going on this, anybody who is inadvertently, let's say, paid in a way they shouldn't have been, we can now take corrective action when it comes to payroll and be able to establish those, again, on a go forward basis to ensure that if somebody is overpaid, just like anybody who might be overpaid for some payroll error, um, we could follow, follow up on it in the same fashion going forward uh, now that these policies have been clarified and put into place. So, whether the system continues to allow it, we're working on that by putting in a ticket to see if we can get Workday to do the change for us. But if we do our audits, we have these reports in a way that we're able to check and see that there was in fact an error in pay, we can make that reversal known to the to the member and make them aware of the change and how the policy says they should have been paid versus than what the system may have allowed them to be paid, if that makes sense. That makes a ton of sense. Uh, I wanna open the, the floor to questions from uh, committee members. I see Councilman Cohen and then Councilman Ramos and then Councilman Glover. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the BPD team. Um, I wanted to respond to uh, another OIG report. I think that was out today. Um, slightly different topic, but of a similar nature, which is um, a gentleman who was on payroll for an extended period of time after having shot a teenager. It was pretty high profile case. I'm just curious, it, it would seem that a fairly basic forensic audit of um, payroll and overtime would identify that. Um, so Eric definitely heard loud and clear um, and the advancements you all are making, but could you all speak to just sort of the process by which we, are, do we do regular financial audits? Do we identify when folks are supposed to be off the payroll and are still on the payroll and are actually receiving increased salaries? 
over and over and over again. Um, I think the report said the person, a civilian, would have been able to do that job at a substantially lower rate. Um, so just kind of curious on response to that piece. Well, thank you for that, uh, Council Member. I think part of what I, I want to make sure is known is when when a member or or there's an issue of, of discipline, there's there's not too much I could talk to about the specific members. I, I can't really go into the detail about an individual's circumstances, but I will say that as a general policy, we want to make sure that members are serving in roles for which, uh, if you're a sworn member, that you can actually you would need to be a sworn member to perform those roles. Um, a lot of what we found in the case that you're speaking of uh, had to do with a lot of decisions made prior to when our team was ever in place. Um, and again, in our response to the OIG's report on this matter, uh, we found that this particular member fell into a very similar status as a number of medically uh, incapable members. That's the wrong word, probably. Uh, but it's folks who are unable to return to full service for medical reasons. Um, and if you're not able to do the job of a police officer for that reason, there is a provision in our MOU that allows for separation uh, and to make sure that they apply to the FNP for whatever benefits that they're entitled. But if you can't do the role of a, of a police officer, you should not continue to earn wages as a police officer. Uh, and that is the principle under which the MOU governs our ability to separate members who are medically unable to return to full service. We found that this particular member also had a form of permanent disability, but in the form of a disciplinary matter uh, that prevented him from becoming a full uh, member ever again. And so the same terms and conditions were applied equitably to him. Uh, and that's where um, that's where the department was, again, providing that information in the in the report that was provided uh, earlier today. Our response to that matter was to uh, offer that member the same path of separation as those other medically uh, suspended members who could not turn to full service. Uh, that all being said, our goal is to civilianize to the greatest extent possible every and every, every function that we can um, because administrative responsibilities that are performed by police officers means that we have fewer police officers doing what only police officers can do. Our goal is very clear in that matter. We're looking for every piece of resource we can get in order to make that happen. Our staffing plan submitted with the court is built with that in mind because that is our mandate. And so what was found with this particular member was the fact of the matter of his permanent status as a as a suspended member prohibited him from doing anything beyond uh, what an administrative functionary could do. And so the comparative is a fair one. Of, of a civilian position being able to cover this responsibility, but we're covering that responsibility with the member's salary uh, commensurate with the police officer and, and then authorizing overtime for it, which was widely inappropriate, which is why we took action, which is why we've changed it, which is why we since civilianized that function and we'll continue to do so at every part of the department where we have similar circumstances. So, no, I appreciate that. I, I guess what I'm asking is, like, why did it take for an OIG report for that to get identified? I mean, gentleman, according to um, the gentleman was making one hundred and fifty eight thousand um, dollars in, in, in his last year. Um, so I guess what I'm asking is, are there, um, you know, it, it, would there been a would there have been a way to identify this? What are we doing to proactively make sure there aren't cases, whether it's medical or in this case, I think it's a little more egregious because of the circumstances under which he could no longer perform police duties, um, given that you know he shot someone and there's a big public trial around it. And, and I know, you know, we um, just seems like it should have been identified earlier. So just curious, is, is there, do we have anything in place to try to root this out before it gets 28 years in? I appreciate that. Yeah, I, I, you know, without going into the individual's matter, um, yes, the short answer is there are ways to identify these issues uh, without having an OIG bring them to our attention. Uh, part of it is, again, assessing everyone's position in the department, looking at their duties, understanding why they are 
performing those duties as a police officer in this case, and whether or not it's appropriate for them to continue conducting those duties. Uh, we look at everything from overtime spend, uh, overtime spend by member. You know, we, we have these lists for which we generate uh, the highest earners in the department and make sure that whatever they're doing is commensurate within policy and within operational need. Uh, those kinds of systems have been put into place as far back as when we first arrived in April of 2019, but it is a continuation of all those policies going forward. Uh, in this particular matter, there were a lot of legal questions that had to be answered before action could be taken. Um, and without going into the full details of the matter, it, it was brought to our attention prior to the OIG filing report. Gotcha. All right. Um, yeah, just closing would just say, I mean, you know, I think, again, for the well being of the department and the public and all of us, you know, just having folks on payroll um, for that long, uh, not, you know, not, not, not doing police duties and collecting that kind of paycheck is just feels like a punch in the gut when we see that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Alex. Thank you, Councilman Cohen. Uh, Councilman Ramos and then Councilman Glover. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Chief, I thought I heard you say that uh, some of these things you're hearing anecdotally and then you're trying to address it. This is kind of where I think my colleague was going. Has your office gone through the MOU and all of the policies so that these kinds of things don't happen? It seems to me like, it seemed to me that the department is waiting for stuff to be brought up and then addressing it as opposed to being proactive and addressing it ahead of time. Am I accurate in that? Due respect, I, I think, uh, no ma'am, you're not. I do believe we are actively trying to work these issues. Um, a number of efforts have been brought to our attention. The first is uh, an overall audit of overtime uh, was conducted in 2018, uh, again, predating our administration, but we we're privy to those findings. Um, you know, we look at the practices of the MOU. Uh, you're talking to one of the lead negotiators of the FOP MOU. Uh, and so I'm very familiar with these provisions. I sit on as the step four for grievances when they arise on, the, on behalf of the police commissioner. Uh, I see the direct impact, both anecdotal and actual test cases. Uh, and all of that is brought to bear in how we address and respond to those issues through collective bargaining, which is a procedural process that we go through every few years. Um, make no mistake, they are on our minds and they are uh, in our uh, thought process and in our negotiation strategies. But the principles of past practice continue to govern how we are obligated to perform administrative functions. And this goes back towards grievance procedures, you know, arbitration procedures, they matter in the sense of what our department is able to do differently and enforce differently. If it's within policy to change, we can change it. If it's with technology that we can change it, we're changing it. Um, and if it's requiring us to bring it to the bargaining table, that's something absolutely we're, we are doing. Again, I can't go into the details of what that really means given the nature of bargaining, but I can tell you, as we've said in our report, it is top of mind. It is something we're seeing. It's more than anecdotal. We are looking at the data. We've been looking at the overtime data from, you know, the first month that the police commissioner, you know, was installed into office and finding ways to create better controls and understanding why the numbers are what they are and putting into power whatever we can put into power in, in that in that policy realm. But we get pushback. We get pushback from a culture of, of, of pervasiveness of this overtime issue that we're faced with that we, we are very, <laughs> we're trying to push a rock up a hill and it's very difficult. Um, but with the support of our monitors, with the support of uh, the mayor's office, with, with everybody on this issue, on, on trying to do more with less and trying to reduce our, our unnecessary spend when it comes to the department's overtime spending, absolutely. We want to make sure it's done in a proactive way, not just reactive. But we're not going to be, we're not perfect. We want to, we want to make sure that we're being responsive to when these issues are brought forward to our attention. And so we will make sure that we 
respond quickly and, and with decisive action when those things are brought to our attention. I hope that answers so, your question. Uh, sort of. In this particular, I appreciate that you're going through those details. Um, in this particular case, you knew that this practice was allowed in the MOU? In this particular case, we were aware is it as a past practice, but we needed to understand what our legal footing was to be able to address it in the way that would not result in us having whatever decision we made reversed. And so for us, again, we're, we're kind of bound by a lot of these past practices, especially with how the MOU is interpreted. And that interpretation is, is bound through arbitration processes that, you know, are go above our heads, essentially, the way that our agreement is confected. Yes. Right. So, so um, it sounds like you knew about it, but felt like your hands were tied until now we've got yeah. this public report saying, you know, this is a problem and we're now facing, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to get to the, this issue Understood. of we, um, you're going through all of this and I'm grateful that all the, the task force is formed, you know, overtime is such a big deal for us. So I really appreciate it. But I'm I'm disturbed about the fact that if we're um, you know if you're seeing some of this stuff the these policies in place and then mm. not able to or not um, thinking about when you're going to actually try to take action and then an OIG report comes up and then it's like okay we got to take action right? right so it should not actually take an OIG report to make that happen. And I'm also right. hearing a little bit from you about um, the, the negotiating between the FOP and yourself. And I understand that that can be difficult. And I think maybe offline, I would like to have a conversation a little bit more about that and um, what uh, possibly we can, we can do to make sure that these past practices, which are a waste of taxpayer dollars, um, are no longer in those documents. Um, and and that we don't get another OIG report saying that these are are in there. So I, all I'm saying, I was just thank you, Mr. Chair, for indulging me. I was just trying to you know get to sort of um, that that piece. The the last um, piece I had was whether or not the people that have been um, abusing this particular policy are going to have to pay it back. <sighs> Right. So again, part of what we've established with our policy going forward is that if we're able to identify it, then we can address it going forward. Um, because of the nature of past practices, because of the way it's interpreted, because of it being something that the system would have allowed for without any any action to reverse, I, I'd have to, you know, with respect, get get my legal advisors to tell me whether or not that's possible. We will explore it. Uh, but I don't know if the answer, I don't know the answer to your question. Um, and it's because of that kind of past practice argument that I was referring to. And, and, and just to put a, a bit of a response to what you, what you provided earlier. And again, I, I appreciate, we're actually saying the same thing, believe it or not. I want to be able to not have an OIG report compel action by, by every stretch of the imagination. Uh, but I do think that in the, in the case that we have here, um, a lot of what was allowed to occur had a lot to do with the fact that the ADP system was very permissive in this ability to do it. The Workday system is a lot less permissive and it's a whole lot more transparent. Uh, and I think that's the biggest problem is that it's not that we didn't know it anecdotally, it's that we couldn't prove it. Workday is very clear. If you don't work during your schedule, you don't get paid unless you're authorized the overtime for it. That's how we have our structure set up. Without that kind of mechanism in place, which ADP didn't really allow for, this kind of activity could go on without any way of auditing it or you know, discovering it on a whole scale basis. Now we have the tools to be able to prevent it. And I think that's a big difference and I wanted to point that out if that's okay. Um, but again, I appreciate your, your support of our efforts in this regard. And uh, if I can give you information regarding uh, the other topics you're looking for offline, I'd be happy to do that. Thank you very much for taking the time to answer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilman Ramos. Uh, Councilman Glover. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank uh, everybody for coming out this evening to share your thoughts and uh, for the OIG report. So for the OIG report, we I do know that um, they went out and they did an investigation to find that 
there were many, you know, officers that were getting paid over time that had taken, like, I guess, vacation time and things of that nature. What I want to ask you, um, Eric, is, is this, uh, I know it's past practices of things of that nature, but is this illegal or was it needed? And the reason why I'm asking if it was needed is because of the fact that if I'm just giving a prime example, I don't know for sure. I'm just trying to get some answers. If uh, I'm an officer and I'm off, you know, for the next three days due to the fact that maybe I had uh, uh, some leave of absence time and I may have to take some of that time because like, there's no rolling over time. Uh, and then there is a need, you know, here in Baltimore City, we're short of officers. And, and when I, the reason why I ask that is because of the fact that those three days I'm off, we have a district that's not fully like to the capacity to doing the work over in a certain district. What I'm asking is, do you guys reach out to officers that are on vacation because of the fact that we have no officers at all to cover the shifts in certain districts? And the reason why I'm asking that is because is this the reason why we're allowing officers that were on vacation to come also and work overtime to get paid? Or is this just not common practice? We're not supposed to do this. Well, I mean, part of what, Mr. Uh, Council Member, I think part of what we want to make sure of is officer wellness on this. I mean, we, we are very concerned about um, the amount of overtime hours that members spend and if a person's on vacation um we want to make sure they take their vacation we want to make sure that they are going to be restful for them to return to work in a in, in a way that's productive uh look our staffing shortages are are real they are um you know persistent and we have to address them with aggressive recruitment strategies and we offer voluntary overtime to cover specifically our patrol shifts on a regular basis because of exactly what you just described and so we, we have to acknowledge that. But if a member goes on vacation and decides that they wanna in fact work on that day, the question comes about whether or not we should be paying them, not just you know the hours of work that they would come in, not just the hours of work that they're paid for and leave, but effectively time and a half on top of their hours of leave. That's a real question. And, and that's something where the policies we have, the choices we make, you know, have a financial impact. Um, leveraging that person's willingness to come back on shift, you know, that's that's a question of whether they should just take themselves off of vacation and be on shift straight time, um, if they're willing to make that uh, voluntary action take place. But if a member is on vacation, you know, we don't obligate them to come off of vacation. That doesn't happen in any real way. We do have to result to drafting sometimes, which is, a, again, a considerable issue that has to be taken seriously when we're trying to fill our patrol needs. But it's not going to be drafting volunteers. It's not going to be drafting members who are on vacation. And we aren't soliciting people to come off of vacation. These are, these are voluntary actions that are occurring from members who understand and appreciate the system and structure that we have and are seeking to earn overtime and, and be paid their time off simultaneously for the exact duration of work. And, you know, that's something for which we have to decide as, as, a, as a department, as a city. Yes, it is legal. The short answer to your question is yes, it is legal. Yes, it is permissible. Uh, should we be doing it? That is a whole other issue. And that's what we're looking at because uh, we want to make sure we're incentivizing the right behavior in the department and that we're not, um, you know, creating the disincentives to to game a system that is not uh, not appropriate. I hope that answers your question. So, it's something, but can the logic, can you answer something? I appreciate it, thank you. Yeah, uh, go yes, ahead. Uh, oh, go, uh, um, I, I just wanted to add, can I, um, that my office didn't look at patrol. We were looking into administrative type of situations. That was the focus of the investigation. Also, it's also important to know that this came as a result of a hotline complaint. So it may have been legal, but it was of such a concern to the person that, you know, reported it that they didn't realize that this was the way the system was working at the time. And they brought it forward to us as, um, as a waste situation. 
And in the end, um, you know, through the BPD, they determined that, and that's probably why the, they sent the email out to everybody, because it could be a way that the city could utilize funds and overtime in a better manner. But as Michelle said um, earlier, and I, it was kind of distracting because that's that's Michelle down there, um, because all we were looking at was a table <laughs> um, that we did not look. And Michelle, um, can you just tell what were the departments that we were actually? Because I can't remember. It wasn't. I know we didn't look at patrol. Right. So what we what we didn't look at was patrol, and we didn't look at um, spe special operations like SWAT um, and things of that nature. What we were looking at was potentially collapsible posts. So administrative posts, um, like I said earlier, quartermasters, um, we were looking at building security, not to say that building security isn't a necessity, but not those um, mandated foot patrol, those particular officers. What the complaint looked at specifically were the ones that fall under the administrative bureau within the BPD. So that's what we kind of looked at. And then we looked at posts. Um, where individuals are looking at CCTV um, cameras and things of that nature. Do you need to have a sworn police officer sitting there um, for those particular posts? Councilman so, Okay, so thank you. So to get clarification on all this, right, we're not looking at patrol officers, correct? Because when it came out, it seemed like we're looking at the entire Baltimore City Police Department. And, you know, I'm listening to Eric and, you know, they're saying that, you know, it's not illegal what's going on, but now, you know, I'm hearing that, you know, you guys took it upon yourself to do an investigation or individuals that were like at certain posts and things of that nature. But what it, what it perceived to the public is that it's Baltimore City Police as a whole, not like, uh, you know, breaking, broken down into different uh, agencies within the department. And that's the reason why I act as a patrol, because again, you know, this is Baltimore City, we're, we're, we're short of patrol officers off on the street. And what I'm wondering is that the individual that wants to spend his time on vacation and he's asked to come in because, you know, you have officers that say, you know what, I'm going home for the day. I don't want to work any overtime. That right. they're, they're not being forced to be drafted to the next shift. You know, those individuals are willing to come off their vacation to work, you know, that overtime. And, I, and when I say come off the vacation, meaning that eight hours that they're off for that, for that vacation period, yeah. is when they then start their overtime. And not just this, are we looking at it as just the Baltimore City Police Department or all city agencies as a whole when it comes to them taking off of uh, work false vacation, but it's a need. And the reason why I'm saying it because I'm uh, a, a, a past worker of the Department of Public Works. And you know it may have been instances where an individual may have taken off of work vacation. And before you know it, this blizzard has come. And when the blizzard come, you know, we're central employees, all hands got to be on deck. So now that accumulates over time because now the individual is coming off their vacation and now they're coming on to do a job. This is, I'm, I'm just trying to balance and yeah. figure out exactly, you know, where, where we're at across the right. board when it comes to, you know, utilizing the vacation time of an individual and then also give them the overtime uh, in patrol and even essential workers that are doing the work like uh, on the ground. Yeah. And council member, I think part of what we're trying to understand with our ability to see now this, our systems can see this. It's not just, you know, finding it in um, patrol or not patrol. For us, we need to see the whole department and we need to make, make sure that we understand why it's happening. And in instances where it's absolutely not necessary, then making sure we take the right action to prevent it from occurring. Um, you know, you described a situation in an emergency environment. You know, when, when the George Floyd protests were happening last year, it was all hands on deck for us too. And there was a lot of folks that were willing to come in, and even though they had taken vacation, were willing to come in, the system still carried them on vacation. And, you know, again, our old ADP system being what it was during that period of time, you know, part of it is is maybe that's a justifiable reason, maybe it's not, but we want to make sure we understand why it's happening. And for, for the first time with our workday systems now, we have to be able to have that visibility, pull those reports, know it's happening, so that we can drill down and ask questions why. And we didn't have that before. That's a big change from where we are today. And I think that's a that's a key thing for us. Understanding the why is just as important as the how much. 
And being able to answer both questions is our goal when it comes to enforcing this policy, making sure it's done right, because the alternative is nobody on the street. That may not be an it acceptable definitely, alternative. It's definitely give me a better understanding of the conversation because of the fact that now I'm hearing from the OIG that, you know, it was individuals that weren't on patrol as opposed to individuals that are on patrol because I see things differently where yeah. there are emergency situations because they're on the street. They're in, you know, they're doing patrol as opposed to individuals sitting behind a desk and said, I'm just going to come in and get some overtime. I think that's abuse in that uh, aspect there. So, um, Mr. Chair, do you mind if I, I speak? Please do, yeah. So, Councilman Glover, our specific complaint came about in a specific unit, but because the FOP MOU is an MOU for the entire BPD, we have to look at it in its totality. So it doesn't just look specifically to here or there. So we didn't want to write the report in saying, oh, well, we're highlighting this or that. This is a practice that is an acceptable practice, a past practice for all of BPD. So yes, there are times when there are emergency situations and that is why we did not focus on those particular instances. One, the complaint did not involve those units patrol, um, SWAT, special operation units. They spoke to specifically these administrative units, but we did have to make it clear that it is a past practice. It is an acceptable practice per um, the FOP MOU and the labor negotiations. So I just wanted to make that clear. We were not targeting um, BPDs over time here, but it is something that we wanted to highlight because there is potential for abuse um, with that particular practice. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Ms. Thomas. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Councilman Glover. Um, any other questions from uh, council members? Uh, Councilman Burnett hasn't had a, a question yet. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so as a, a quick follow up on uh, Councilman Glover's line of questioning, um, I, I think it was helpful that, to, to get clarity on what the, the positions that were being focused on uh, as it related to this policy. Um, can someone from BBD, I guess, I'm, I'm sort of struggling to understand then what would, for an administrative position, what would be some of the reasons that uh, they would need overtime uh, to do those positions, particularly in the context of the Maryland General Assembly's actions to push for more civilianization of administrative jobs. Because um, we're talking about a, a lot of money here, uh, potentially um, being wasted in, 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 you know, uh, in the context of there needing to be a push to have more civilians hired into these roles in the first place. So what would pe people be doing over time in these roles, uh, just generally speaking? Eric, you're muted. Uh Sorry about that. Yes. So great question, council member. I think if we're looking at sworn members that are performing administrative tasks, um, more often than not, they fall into a lot of investigatory capacity. So for, for instance, uh, Public Integrity Bureau has a lot of folks who are behind a desk, if you will, but they're performing uh, an investigative function for which they might need overtime. They might need to complete that case. A lot of district detective work um, is not considered patrol. It's considered non-patrol. Uh, and so it really depends on what kind of category we're slicing and cutting together. Uh, I mean, even our NCOs, our neighborhood coordination officers, are considered administrative in some form or fashion. Those could have overtime associated with, you know, events that take them beyond their shift or, or community engagements that take them beyond their shift. Um, you know, there are some administrative officers in the district who have to, uh, you know, put together reports and, and statistics and everything else for the district. Uh, that could take them into uh, into administrative functions that may go beyond their shift. And, and so our goal is to make sure that everybody is staying on task and, and in schedule uh, to perform their work within the prescribed amount of time. We have established budgets for all of this uh, for every uh, division and district uh, in the agency. Uh, that was something we put into place, uh, which apparently wasn't in place before we got here, uh, at least in a, in a way that managers could be held to account to say, well, our system is saying you're spending this level. You only had this allocation. What's going on? You know, and we constat that process on a regular basis. Um, you know, we have our recruitment division has a lot of sworn members. We have uh, sworn members in our training academy who have to stay after their shift in order to develop curriculum and, and get ready for 
the next week. And so there's a host of functions that could fall under that administrative category. The difficult part for us is justifying a person coming off of vacation to work overtime. Again, I, I can't see a scenario in which that would be for administrative functions an acceptable practice, which is why I think Councilman uh, Glover, you made a great point is that, you know, the why is just as important as the how much. And for us, those administrative functions, again, where possible, we should be looking to increase our number of civilian staff, get to a place where we can have those functions performed uh, with, with civilian support. Uh, but there are certain functions like investigative functions that might still need a swarm component for it. But we're looking at everything when it comes to our staffing plan. Got it. Okay. That, that's helpful context for me um, to, to see the, the full scope of that because uh, I, I wasn't quite understanding it. Uh, my, my second question, uh, and, I, and I guess kind of know the answer to it, but um, the I guess because it's, a, it's an allowable policy, there is is there an opportunity or is there not an opportunity, I guess, to recoup some of those funds uh, back from the individuals that were doing this? Um, and if not, is that something that would be considered moving forward if there was a change yeah. in policy? So so the, the second question is yes. I think what our policy going forward clarifies is that it will no longer be an acceptable practice from here on. And if it's found that the system paid you a certain way and it was outside of policy, recouping it will become an option. I don't have an answer to your first question. As I mentioned to Councilmember Ramos, uh, I'm looking through our LAR department to help us get clarity on the issue um, to know whether or not that's something possible going backward. Um, but I just I don't have an answer for that question. Thank you, Ms. Chair. Um, I, I, I got another question. I, I, I'm really curious. It sounds like this is something that could still potentially happen. Um, so I, I'd really like the opportunity to um, to have the task force that Commissioner Harrison's pulled together come in and um, talk to the committee about what they're seeing. I think it'd be helpful. Um, right. do you, uh, who, who's on the task force and um, how soon do you think they would um, perhaps be able to brief the committee on um, what what they're working on and, and how we how we want to completely nip this in the bud? Well, I, I think part of what we've described earlier was whether the system allows it to occur and and whether or not we take action to recoup it later is is one issue we are trying to address. Uh, we're trying to address it on the front end so that the system will actually make the change for a person before the payment is ever remitted so that it's a properly aligned person had their vacation time ascribed to a period it would give them back their vacation day and pay them the straight wage automatically instead of authorizing overtime the way it currently does. And so we're, we have a ticket in for that. Uh, our policy, again, clarifying where the proper remittance should go allows us to recoup it after the fact if it does, in fact, inadvertently occur. Uh, as far as members of the task force, I know, Shala, you probably have a more expansive list, but it's myself, Chief Graham. We're working with uh, across the street, uh, a lot of folks in our finance, uh, you know, the city's finance department. Um, and so if you have that list, Shala, if you could read it off, if not, we can get it to you to make sure you know who's on it. Chief Graham. Yeah, we're working with some external partners. We also have an internal um, control group as well. When we see things within Workday, we have an internal policy group. Um, so we sit there and we look at things when, because this is new to us, right? We've never had transparency into this data before. So when we see policy issues, we send out clarifying emails of what the policy is. And um, if we see something that needs to be clarified in policy because it's not clear enough, we, we're writing notations so that in this big policy overhaul, it can be addressed yeah. and it can be clear. So we are taking a lot of corrective action internally as we see these things in Workday. You know, in the last eight months, I think it's been wonderful. You know, yes, we had to stabilize from Workday, but we, we, we have access to our data, which is so refreshing. Yeah. And um, so not only is there the, the task force group, there's the internal policy group, um, and we have mm -hmm. a list of corrective actions we're going to be taking in, in the policies. And at, at this moment, I, I have to give credit to some members of the FOP on this one. They come to us with questions all the time on what the right thing to do is, believe it or not. And that is to us very helpful because the, they just, again, they want to get the system right too. They want to make sure that they're not doing it incorrectly or that they're not considering something incorrectly. And so we appreciate that partnership. They've been working with 
Chief Graham on a weekly basis to get clarity on what about this situation? What about that situation? You know, we used to do it this way in the old system. How do we do it in the new way, the right way in the current system? Uh, and we appreciate their ability to communicate with us when their members are having these questions and that they can bring it to our attention and we can create uniformity and consistency in the application of those decisions across the department. And thank you. Uh, that That's really helpful. I, the, the other question I have is actually for the IG. Um, did we look into or we have we at all looked into any other agencies to see if this is an issue that that happens in any other agencies besides BPD? Um, we, we can start there. So one thing I will say is that um, in it might have been 2018 or 2019, we did um, look into solid waste uh, and the overtime there because there was a large amount of overtime being spent there. Uh, we received a complaint in there, um, that issue as well. So we did work with BBMR. We worked with the Department of Public Works at that time to gather the information and to outline that um, use of overtime there. and from what I can remember, and I've, we've had continuous meetings with the Department of Public Works. They've been inputting internal controls, reclassifying individuals, and also trying to phase out the community, um, not the community aides, the temporary workers, so that, that it is more appealing for people to come in full time and then um, fully staffed. They talked about a staffing study and things like that. So as far as looking at um, a small, portion of the overtime usage we've only looked at and Isabel you can jump in um, the Department of Public Works and BPD at this level. Yeah I think that's correct. So, um, I'm sorry I just want to clarify uh, my question so we found you're saying we found with uh, DPW that yes. similarly folks were getting time and a half by working during their vacation? So with DPW, um, the local 44 uh, MOU states that solid waste workers, um, laborers, as well as drivers can work a task system. So what that means is they are supposed to work Tuesday through Friday for 10 hour days. Their task is assigned. So that route may take them four hours, it may take them eight hours. So if they work from 6 a.m. because their shifts start at 6 and they're supposed to end at 4, they make from 6 to 12 and that route is completed. They will get paid for the entire shift and can work another task, which may be another route at time and a half. That time and a half will start at the conclusion of that first task. That is an acceptable practice. It is not um, illegal in any way and technically it is not double dipping because it is written within policy. However, what we were saying in our report was maybe we need to look at re-evaluating um, the routes so that the route length can span um, the allotted shift time and or restructuring and staffing in a different way so that we are utilizing the workforce in a more appropriate fashion versus us paying overtime because these individuals are um, getting done with their original task quicker. So it's, it's a little bit different. Um, individuals were called in on overtime, like uh, Councilman Glover said, when there are emergencies, they are called in. That is something very different when there's emergencies, there's all hands on deck, a water main break or things of that nature. So because of the negotiated MOUs, there are certain things that are allowable that looked like perceived waste or um, money that may be wasted that we could use in a different fashion. I hope that answers your question. And I, I will add that report is actually online. It was the DPW investigation and it was um, the task work became a pretty, pretty large issue at the time. That, that, that's really helpful. I, um, it a little bit confusing because they, they are slightly different issues, but they are related. It, it, it makes me really wonder if there is something that we should be thinking about citywide and how we we go about um, these scenarios. Um, and if you have any recommendations there, please feel free to let me know. We did, uh, we did explain in the report that um, that that was actually done back in um, William Donald Schaefer's time to try to bring the pay up because of, of these, the, um, 
the situation that was existing in Baltimore at the time and um, try to bring the pay up to a more fair amount. So really what could happen is someone could work, like Michelle said, from six to noon, and then they work from noon to, to four when their shift ended and they're getting time in it. They're actually getting two and a half times during that, that second time period because it was, it was scheduled that, that way. And so that is what we were trying to bring some focus to. Um, I don't think, and Michelle, you can correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think we've come across any other areas. Um, the only other place I could think of would be, was there anything like that in DOT? I think you're on mute. With that, with that particular type of issue, no. There were some isolated incidences, of course, in other agencies where there's overtime abuse, but they were individual, it wasn't systemic, or because of a policy that accepts this as practice. Um, so like I was saying, Councilman um, Conway, it's an acceptable practice that essentially could look or be perceived as ways to the citizens of Baltimore that we may need to kind of bridge that gap and close that loophole. I see. So it's similar to this in that way. It could be perceived, and I see why we didn't call it so clearly. Um, waste. There's there's a little little bit of nuance there potentially. Um, okay. Um, I'm going to continue uh, with the second round of questions. I, I I don't see Councilman Cohen on the line. Which uh, Councilman Cohen, do you have any questions? No, I'm I'm good. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Councilman Ramos. My second question was and was asked and answered. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilman, uh, I think Glover, were you next? Yeah, just, I don't have any more questions. Just want to say thank you for uh, being transparent and then open it up and give us clarification on exactly, um, exactly what you guys were looking for. And even getting back down to, uh, what I consider to be my heart, like solid waste, you know, because it is misunderstood that, you know, these guys go out there, they, you know, they get a route and they're getting overtime when at the end of the day, you know, these are guys and, and women that are doing jobs that many of us don't even want to do. And uh, it's task work and it's, and it's hard labor. So again, to just bring clarification and we're on the public forum to let them know that, that we're not abusing any waste or if they're not abusing any waste, um, but they're actually doing that job and they're doing that task. So again, thank you for clarifying everything, uh, even when it comes to the Baltimore City Police Department, so that the public can get a better understanding of exactly uh, what the OIG report was uh, about, and then the Baltimore City Police Department could do you know a better job at uh, those individuals that are getting paid the overtime from off of uh, pay vacation that we can uh, uh, try as much as we can to eliminate that situation for non-patrol officers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Councilman Glover. Um, Councilman Burnett. Um, I, I, I did have, um, oh, sorry, okay. go ahead. Please go ahead, Councilman Burnett. Um, yeah, and I, I didn't, I, I think would, would um, second your request to, to bring in a task force because I did have some more like tedious questions around process, so looking forward to that. Um, I guess broadly speaking for the department um, around uh, managerial oversight. So it was mentioned that, you know, even for these administrative positions, there are reasons um, that uh, folks would do overtime. I guess broadly speaking, are there very clear uh, supervisory protocols in place for acceptable activities um, or events or after hours kind of things that would qualify for or, or would be allowed for overtime versus things that maybe be not and i guess what is the oversight for that supervisor supervisor level it's a great question the answer is yes we have uh stated goals throughout the department for those kind of administrative functions most of them are tied to case management making sure that we're able to get through whatever type of case they're working on be it a disciplinary case be it a uh crime that's being investigated, uh, background that's being processed for, uh, let's say, recruitment. All of those have metrics around it. Those performance metrics are managed in various forms within the department. Uh, a lot of it through the CONSTAT process, which is a weekly basis. 
uh, a weekly recurrence. We also have it looked at through the mayor's office. They look at it through police staff for us. And so uh, these are all metrics that, again, we're feeding the data in. We have better systems than we've ever had before that give us clarity and how this money is being spent, why it's being spent, and for what purpose. And the issues for which it's not justifiable, it needs to stop. And those members are held to account. Those managers are held to account. Um, because again, part of our policies are designed to create that level of transparency, that feedback, and uh, we're able to do that on a weekly basis. Got it. I'll hold the rest uh, for the follow-up hearing, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Burnett. I actually have uh, just a couple more questions, and uh, these are for uh, once again the the IG. Um, so I, I wanted. I want to ask more about what we understand about other agencies. Do we know if this is or could be a problem with other agencies? And I want to be specific to um, the issue that we identified with BPD, where we have someone on vacation, maybe called mm -hmm. in or signing up for a shift and getting time and a half plus vacation. Um, are, are we seeing that? In a, is that possible in other agencies? Have we looked into that? Do you want to answer that, Michelle? Um, yes. So, is it possible in other agencies? So, based off of the MOUs, um, for the most part, and I'm not speaking about um, emergency. So, like BPD or fire department, we haven't looked in, looked um, into the fire department. We haven't had any issues regarding that. Uh, as I stated previously, it only looks like with the issues that we've seen they have been called in for emergency, snow removal, um, water main breaks, things of that nature, which because the MOU states you have to have a certain amount of time to let someone know a shift will be changed, there are provisions within the MOUs that state that if you call a person in on their leave time that they are um, eligible for this particular type of pay. So no, I don't see anything systemic in this that is written into the policy in that nature. Albeit with COVID, there have been some transitions with um, permission leaves being used and some alternative scheduling. So there's kind of been um, a lack of clarity with that. But generally speaking, when operations are um, at full capacity and it isn't infected by a global pandemic, no, we don't see that. And we haven't gotten any complaints about that, sir. Okay, thank you. Um, I think that that may be uh, the, the the end of my questions. Any other questions from the committee before we um, before we recess? Um, I, I think the idea here is we want to return and have a conversation with the task force that's being pulled together by Commissioner Harrison. I think they'll be able to have the time to really dig into these issues. Um, and maybe further inform what policies we should be thinking about, or rather BPD is already thinking about and implementing to make sure that we don't see additional waste um, for, from this practice. Um, with that, yeah, I Mr. Mr. Chairman, we're, we're happy to, to share those findings as we continue to develop them. And again, our, our goal is to be as transparent as we can with, with any agency that wants to, to learn about our practices in case another agency wants to adopt them. I mean, part of what we hope to be able to find in this is is a is a path that again maximizes the resources we have and and puts it all towards what we know needs to be prioritized and that's the grind fight that's what we that's what we're doing it for. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you, um, Eric, and I, I appreciate you guys um, jumping right onto this as soon as we uh, brought it up, um, Councilman. Um, Councilman Glover, your question. Yes, I have one final uh, just question. I just wondered uh, it's for the Baltimore City Police Department. Did you the those that were on those job sites do do we have to have Baltimore City police officers to uh, be on those sites, or can we use like civilians just to take over those uh, those jobs? Because again, um, we we wasted three hundred thousand dollars, you know, throughout the years. Uh, I think you stated twenty five thousand dollars a month. Um, I look at their other potential people that can have jobs and not be Baltimore City Police. You know, there are there any other ways you guys can go about about that? Or well, again, I, I 
as I mentioned before, our goal is to aggressively civilianize as many functions as we can. I'm not sure that the particular overtime spending that we're talking about observing are tied to those administrative functions one for one. Again, we're, we're trying to parse out that data. What the OIG looked into was the administrative functions. What we're finding in our financial data is the entire department. So it could, in, it could include a number of positions that are not civilianizable, if you will. Um, but again, part of our goal is to do that exact calculation. And if we're spending X number of dollars on overtime and we could be spending Y on hiring civilians to perform those tasks, we might even be able to save money out of the deal by by doing something like that. And that's the kind of, you know, deep dive into our budget that we are absolutely interested in doing. And we're partnering with the mayor's office on a lot of that uh, that effort. And so for us, that is that is definitely something we're looking at. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have one more question and um, this kind of just popped up. So when officers are deemed medically unable to return to full duty um, and there is no, there's no eligibility for medical retirement, is there a process to transition them into civilian positions? Well, the short answer is that the transition of process is like any open application process. A member could seek a, a civilian position that is in the department um, or in the city for that matter. Um, we have a number of civilian openings and we you know, have those on an open advertised basis. We also bring back a number of retired officers to the form of what we call contract services specialist positions. We, we afford those opportunities to every member who separates in good standing that wants to return. Uh, there are some provisions in HR that require a 90 day cooling off period before they return to the department. There are pension rules about whether or not they can carry their pension but still return as a civilian member that might not you know be advantageous to those members but for the most part we want to make sure that they have all the information that's afforded to them if they want to continue to serve in some capacity many do come back as contract services specialists and we afford that opportunity where our budget allows i want to clarify these are for people who didn't retire uh, not for people who want to come back for for people who stay with us um, is there an opportunity to transition them into um, civilian positions? Again, as I, as I articulated, the, the positions are open. If they're qualified for them pursuant to civil service rules, they can and they, they, they're able to do so. There are provisions about their ability to earn pension eligibility in pension system for fire and police versus civilian positions, which is an entirely different system. Um, that might result in it not being advantageous for those members to take that path. And so you don't often see it, is what I'm saying. Uh, and so while that path is afforded to them financially, it often is not a decision that is advantageous. And that's because of the rules that are in place regarding pensions in the city systems. That sounds like something we can fix, possibly. Again, it requires further discussion. And, yeah. and I would I would defer to our governmental affairs folks on Sure. That's a little bit outside of the purview of this of this hearing, but happy to entertain yeah. the discussion. Yeah, uh, appreciate it. Thank you. Um, any other questions, thoughts, concerns, closing comments? Uh, I want to thank the. Oh, I'm sorry. Please go ahead. I just wanted to thank you very much for actually inviting us to this because we rarely have the opportunity to actually um, talk, and this has provided a lot of, I think, a lot of um, transparency and accountability to what we do, and I truly do appreciate you offering Michelle and I the opportunity to talk here. Yeah, I appreciate you um, putting the hard work into to making sure that we identify these issues. I appreciate the committee for having a ton of great questions. And uh, most of all, I appreciate BPD for jumping on these issues immediately, um, realizing that it is an issue and um, we want to be on top of it immediately. So um, we will circle back on this um, and I, I look forward to hearing from the task force on the actions that we take and uh, better understand the scope of this problem. It sounds like there's a couple of murky pieces to it, um, but we've already taken a number of significant steps. So I wanna thank you all uh, And this hearing is in recess. Thanks, sir. Thanks. Thank you.